All right, picking up on problem 23 from the 2013 practice exam. We have at a certain school, 17% of the students are enrolled in a psychology course. 28% of students are enrolled in, are enrolled in a foreign language course. And 32% are enrolled in either a psychology course or a foreign language course, or both. What's the probability that a student chosen at random from the school will be enrolled in both a foreign language course and a psychology course? Okay, so um, let's use the, some symbols to set this up. So for psychology, let's put the probability of, let's say um, probability of y, that y is gonna be a psychology. So the probability of y, or probability of being in a psychology course is 0.17. Um, foreign language, is, let's just put f, the probability of f is 0.28. And then the probability of, it says 32% are enrolled in either a psychology course or a foreign language course or both. So that would be the probability of, of u or F. So remember we use this. Did I say U? The probability of Y or F. Probably so we use this union symbol to represent that. So it could be this could mean that they're both um that they that that both Y and F are occurring, or just Y or just F. Um and this is gonna be 0.32. And then what do we wanna find in terms of like our, our setup of a, like, you know, symbols. So we wanna find the probability of being in both a foreign language course and psychology course, the probability of Y and F, so Y intersect F, so the upside down union. What's this gonna be equal to? Now, there's lots of ways, there's several ways to do this. I don't know if there's lots, but there's a couple. You can set up diagrams. Um, but just remember that you have a formula sheet. And since they only give you two formulas in probability, chances are that it's going to be a pretty simple way to set this up if you know how to just apl apply them. Meaning, or my advice for that is that's why I always make sure to set up like, what the problem is saying in words into symbols. Because then we can see that this is just gonna require this equation. And instead of A, we'll just make that Y. And instead of F, we'll just make that B or, or vice versa. So, moving this down, you can see both, so you know I'm not making this up. The probability of, so let's again, let's make that A a Y. And let's say B is F, the probability of Y union F is equal to the probability of Y plus the probability of F minus the probability of them both occurring, probability of Y and F, Y intersect F. Now, um, from here, we are, we're trying to find this. And we already have the other one. So it just becomes a simple algebra equation. So replacing the left at 0.32, that with 0.17, this with 0.28, so minus the probability of y intersect f. So we can then add that or just take away this from the left or subtract whatever whatever you think makes sense. Um, so we would get 0.17 minus that. We get 35, 45. So we get, I'll just write out the work. 0.45 minus the probability of y intersect f. Tracking this, we get negative 0.13 equals the probability of y and f, or then equals the negative probability of y and f, which means then that the probability of y and f is then just positive 
maybe it wasn't necessary for me to have to write all the work, but I like to. So the answer is just going to be D. Probably ones are the toughest ones on the test. Um, so really practice those. Um, practice, practice, practice. 24. Monthly rent was determined for each apartment in a random sample of 100 apartments. The sample mean was $820, and the sample standard deviation was $25. An approximate 95% confidence interval for the true mean monthly rent for the population of apartments from which the sample was selected is this, 815 to $825. Which of these is the correct interpretation of a 95% confidence interval? Okay, well. Um, I guess I can just go through them and tell you why it is, it's correct or not correct. So A, in this population, about 95% of all rental prices are between eight bit. No, <laughs> because we're not, um, we're trying to find the mean, we're trying to find the mean, um, the mean monthly rent. We're not trying to find an interval. So just, yeah, I don't want to say much more because it'll be confusing in this sample about 95 percent the rental prices are between now now this may be true but this doesn't who cares like we, that's not of course we're going to know what occurs in a sample it's just because we don't care necessarily about what the proportions are in the sample we care about being able to apply those to the population so even though b could be true it's not useful C, in repeated sampling, this method pr produces intervals that include the population mean about 95% of the time. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and we call this like confidence level. Um, we're talking about confidence level. Um, like, remember, we just, um, anytime you generate a confidence interval, it's uh it, it had it's um a, a chance process. It's a pro it's a it's a process that um is based to some extent on luck. I'm not saying there's no logic behind it, but um if you were to do the same process again, in other words, if you were to take another um hundred random, if you were to take if you were to take another sample of a hundred apartments, you probably know that you're not going to get exactly the same interval. Maybe a little different, maybe a dollar difference maybe $10 difference, but you probably won't get the same interval again. Um, the goal is to make an interval where, the goal is to have a process where 95% of those intervals will capture the true population proportion or the true population mean in this case. And so C is correct. Plus you can just tell it's longer than the rest, it sounds correct. Um, and again, D, we don't care. Of course, this is true, but we don't care about getting the sample mean because we know what the sample mean is because it's we have all the information about the sample. I want to say E is way wrong. Never pick E. So C for sure. All right, two friends. Just two. I participate in a game of bowling every week. I've only bowled a couple times in my life and I suck at it. But I'm, but I'm okay with that, in case you want to know. Um, so it's known that their score is approximately normal. Andy has a mean score of 115. So let's just say A is, or sorry, 150. And he, a standard deviation of Andy will be sigma sub A is 30. Bob has a mean score of 165, so B is 165. And he has a standard deviation, so sigma sub B of 15. Let me zoom in, sorry. So actually, let me use yellow. I can zoom out, so you have more space to write this neatly. So two, so, um. What's the probability that Andy will have a greater score than Bob in a single game, assuming that the scores are independent? 
So what's the probability that Andy's score, that A will be greater than B? And I should make this mu sub A, and this will be mu sub B. So that's mean, these are means standard deviation. Okay, so the probability that, that Andy's score will be greater than Bob's. Now, what we're gonna do is make, have another distribution that is basically just Andy's score minus Bob's score. Um, and let's call this, let's call this um, D. D is equal to Andy's score minus Bob's score. And since we want to find when the probability that Andy's score is greater than Bob, that means that A minus B is going to be positive or greater than zero. And so in other words, we want to find the probability that A minus B is greater than zero or the probability that D is greater than zero because that's these are the same thing. Now we have to figure out what the distribution or like what the distribution is of D of the difference. So we want to find the mean of D. And we need to find the standard deviation of D. Okay, so now the mean of D is just gonna be the mean of A minus the mean of B or just 150 minus 165, which is negative 15, which makes sense because um, Andy ha is a, has a lower score than Bob on average. So it makes sense that the, the mean is gonna be negative because that's basically saying that on average, Andy is gonna score 15 points lower than Bob. Now um, the standard deviation does a little different. What you're gonna do is take the square root of the sums of the standard deviations of Andy's score and, and Bob's score. And make sure you square your standard deviations, also known as the variance. So we figure out what this will be. Let's get the standard deviation of D. So we have 30 squared plus 15 squared. So standard deviation of D, 900 plus, the square root of 1125, which is gonna be about 33.54. Let me move that. Now, um, let's just draw a picture now where we're talking about. So that means in this new distribution, this is a distribution of D, where it's centered at negative 15, this is normal, approximately, mean of negative 15 and a standard deviation of 33.5-ish, 0.54-ish. So um, we want to find basically this red area, the area to the right of zero. And for this, you can use just use your calculator. Um, we just use this as our syntax. So go in old school, go to normal CDF. We enter the lower bound first, the left bound first, which is gonna be zero, followed by a comma, then the upper bound, a very big number, comma, then the mean, negative 15, comma, standard deviation. And now again, it will tell us the area to the right of zero um, with a norm in a normal distribution with mean negative 15 and standard deviation 33.54. If you have, if you have a, like a newer calculator, you probably, it'll probably be much easier user friendly to use. Um, in either case, you just get 32-ish or 33, we'll round it. And let's look what we have going back to 25. Yeah, and the answer is D.
yeah, that one took a long time or longer than I think all the ones um, before that. But that's probability for you. So I'm gonna take a break here, but let me know. Again, feedback if you find are finding this helpful. Um, give me a like, of course, or make sure you maybe give me let me know if it's something that um, I missed. And you know, subscribe if you if you think I'm worth it. And I'll see you guys in the next video.